Bishop Byron, it's great to see you again. Thank you for doing this interview. You're quite welcome. Good to be with you. Now, I've heard you speak before about this crisis of spirituality that's yeah. gripping the world. Just to define it a bit, first of all, what do you mean when you say a spiritual crisis? Well, I mean, you know, the imminentism, the materialism, the secularism that has taken hold of much of our culture, at least in the West, I want to be careful about that, which I think has haunted the minds of our young people. If you're told that there's no transcendent point of reference, nothing beyond this world, all there is is, you know, matter in motion, things dumbly here, we're, we've come from nowhere, we're going nowhere, that produces, of course, a deep, you know, thunderstorm in the heart and in the soul. And, you know, it also gives rise to a spiritual longing, which you can see in people. But the crisis is a materialism that has locked people into this little tiny space, the buffered self, as Charles Taylor called it. You know, we're buffered from any contact with the transcendent. Mm -hmm. And it's because produced, death is the final. Yeah, sure. I've, I've come from nowhere, I'm going nowhere. Um, and it's producing. I would say these spiking numbers in depression, anxiety, suicidal tendencies in young people, that's the spiritual crisis. Mm. Yeah, I was going to ask you that. What is the, uh, the knock-on effect? Because, you know, a lot of young people will say, well, it's just about the here and now and live and be the best person you can. And it's all about this life. You don't have to think about any other life. Do your best. Here yeah, the now. problem is that the human heart uh, speaks against that. So we know from St. Augustine and from the Bible, the heart longs for God. Nothing in this world can satisfy the hungry heart. You can deceive yourself for a while, and that happens to a lot of younger people, that you know, enough money and pleasure and power in this world, I'll be happy. But the heart knows otherwise and will rebel against that sort of imminentism. So that can last for a while. But trust me, and I say this as a, as a pastor for many years who's dealt with people at all stages of life, the heart will rebel against that kind of reductionism. What has it been replaced with? As spirituality is declining in the West. What's taking its place? The, the goods of the world. And uh, it's, it's the old idols. You know, the Bible knew about it, of sex and pleasure, power, uh, fame, self-esteem. You know, we'll, we'll fill in that empty space with anything the world can give us. The problem is, as John of the Cross told us, we have these infinite caverns inside of us. And so no matter how much you, you throw into those caverns, it's not going to fill it up. They can be filled only by God, by the infinite. That's easy to state abstractly, but see, people, they live that. They might not be able to say why, but they live that frustration. That's the spiritual crisis of our time. And the church needs to be in the front row speaking these truths. We should not be cowed by the culture into privacy or to take a seat you know, toward the back of the room. No, no, the spiritual voice, as always, needs to be the prime voice in the culture. Mm. I interviewed Dr. Jordan Peterson recently in Canada, yeah. and he made the point, which I thought was very good, that it's not as if young people are not looking for a cause. He said, look at yeah. things like the environmental issues, that they, they're so mobilized and dedicated sure. to fighting for that cause. How does the church convince them that their spiritual life is a cause worth fighting for? You know, I, I like that point, too. I think Peterson's right about that. Um, go back to Ignatius of Loyola. If you've been through the spiritual exercises, you come to that meditation of the two standards. There are two armies assembled. One belongs to the devil, one belongs to Christ. The two standards are raised. Okay, which army are you in? What, what's going to be your fight? Uh, Bob Dylan, my, <laughs> one of my poetic heroes, says, you know, you've got to serve somebody. It might be the devil, it might be the Lord, but you've got to serve somebody. The point is, the autonomous self, that's an illusion. We're always serving some master. Ignatius knew the same thing. Okay, it might be the devil, it might be the Lord, but you've got to join some army. Now, you can deceive yourself for a while. Oh, you know, no, I, I'm not going to decide yet. No, no, then you're in Satan's army. Uh, oh, I, I'm, I'm holding off on that. No, you're in Satan's army then. You, you have to make a decision. So I'm with Peterson. Sure, let's give someone to, something to fight for. Fight in Christ's army. Join his army. Join the cause of the crucified and risen Lord. See, that's an important point, Calm, I think, is, is that Jesus is called Lord, right? And we, we will spiritualize that maybe a little too much. But Curios in the, in the New Testament time, Caesar was called Curios, right? Caesar is the Lord. And when Paul and company are saying, no, Jesus Curios, Jesus is the Lord, they were proposing another banner. Mm. Not Caesar's banner, but Christ's banner. And God knows it got them in a lot of trouble. You know, 
because the Romans knew what they were saying. They knew they were proposing a rival source of authority. Same is true today. Are you in Christ's army or the other one? Because you're in one or the other, whether you like it or not. Look at someone as heroic as John Paul II. He knew these truths, right? He knew that he was fighting in Christ's army. He brought down some of the most powerful forces in the, in the rival army in a way that we would not have imagined when I was a kid. If you had said the Soviet Empire would fall apart with barely a shot fired and the Pope was one of the main players, I mean, it's fantasy. But John Paul understood these dynamics. And so he was urging young people, look at World Youth Day, get in Christ's army, get in Christ's army. That's a good fight for you. But what about those who believe or maybe think in the church that for the young people who are left in the church, that if the church pitches too hard and speaks too much about things like uh, the Eucharist, it could turn young people off because they might just would never be able to comprehend it or they wouldn't believe it. Nonsense. It's on the contrary. And all that, I grew up with that nonsense. And that it's, been, it's caused nothing but havoc in the church. First of all, they can't understand it. That's for the birds. So every young people studying science at the highest level, studying engineering at the highest level, studying law and mathematics at the highest level. Why in the world would we think, oh, they can't understand these themes of theology? I just came from a conference on Thomas Aquinas. You know, Thomas writes the Summa, the famous Summa Theologiae, for beginners. It's for incipientes, he says. It's for beginners in theology. So this high-level text that he designed for 18, 19-year-olds who were just starting off so first of all, that's nonsense. They can't you know, understand it. Secondly, we should challenge them more than we do. Uh, I grew up with the you know, church of relevance and let's make it as easy and user-friendly as possible and let's give you no challenges. That's why they left. That's why they left. Because who cares about such a church? We should intellectually and morally challenge young people, give them something to fight for, give them something substantive to think about, and they know what they stand for, and they, they're going to go, you know, fight for it. How does, how does the church fix it? Go back to the saints. Watch the saints. Uh, you know, I'm with Urs von Balthasar. The greatest theologians are the saints. They're the ones who live these truths. Hold up the Mother Teresa's and the John Paul II's and the, and the uh, Pier Giorgio Frassati's and, and uh, hold up these great figures who embody um, the Catholic way of being and say, you know, be one of them. Be a saint. Now talk about, there's the challenge if you want. Don't settle for spiritual mediocrity. The church doesn't care about that. It cares about saints. It doesn't mean you have to be a you know, world famous figure. It, follow the little way of St. Therese of Lisieux, but be a saint in your life. And you'll, um, as wasn't it um, Catherine of Siena said, you'll, you'll set the world on fire if you become the person God wants you to be. So we fix it by means of the saints and by an honest and smart and beautiful presentation of our faith. Now, the Eucharistic revival, this is something that you have uh, set up to try and combat this spiritual crisis. Can you tell me about it and how it's going at the moment? Yeah, because I didn't set it up. I'll take a little credit because when I was the chair of the, our committee... <laughs> take the on, full credit. I, mean, I won't take full credit because <laughs> when I was chair of evangelization and catechesis, I did say to my brother bishops, I think we got a problem here, everybody, because the Pew Forum study had come out about that 70% not believing in the real presence. I just said, I think we should do something. Do you think that's true, by the way, and sorry to cut across you, that almost 70% of Catholics don't believe in the real presence in the Eucharist? Well, there were some questions about like how the thing was framed and was it just a matter of, you know, was the question framed clearly enough for people? Let me put it this way. There are way, 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 way too many Catholics who don't have an adequate sense of the Eucharist. Let's just leave it at that and maybe leave the numbers aside. And I think we have to address the problem. And that's why we launched this you know, revival, which is coming to a sort of a, a climax this summer in Indianapolis, a big gathering of the whole country, four processions coming from the four parts of the country. Oh, what do you hope will come from it, from this Eucharistic revival? A keener sense of the importance of, of Jesus Christ. You know? So the Eucharist, the real presence of the Lord, it's the great enduring sign of his presence among us. Um, so I hope it awakens people's faith. Go back again to the great saints. From apostolic times to the present day, they're as different as can be, but the one thing they all have in common is a love for the Eucharist, without exception. Saints from first century to the 21st century. Let it be a magnet for young people especially, that's what I want. Bishop, with the Feast of St. Joseph approaching, when we look at um, spiritual fatherhood and the role model that St. Joseph can be to young men, what, what are your insights on that? 
You know, I, I've been thinking about Joseph a lot. I, I, I found a quote from Jose Maria Escrivá, which I really liked. He said, the greatest male saint in our tradition was not a pope, not a bishop, not a cardinal, not a priest, not a deacon, not a you know, churchman. He was a layman. He was a, a husband and an ordinary worker. So St. Joseph, the, the patron of the universal church, the greatest male saint in our tradition. And that should give, I think, hope to a lot of people, you know, who are living ordinary lives, um, look to him. And I think what we see, he's the one who provides for and protects the Holy Family. And it's a great masculine fatherly role. Um, and to live that in the most ordinary way in your family is to live heroically. I love how Joseph never speaks in the, in the Gospels. You never hear one word from him. He's a man of obedience to the Lord. He takes in the divine word and then he does it. He acts. And he acts by providing and protecting. Good. That's a good kind of masculine spirituality and spiritual fatherhood. And I like when you say he was, he's relatable because an yeah. ordinary guy. And, and I know yeah. Mother Angelica, who founded EWTN, once said that she thought the biographers of the saints and the apostles should get 100 years in purgatory each, joking, of course, <laughs> because she said they've made them too unrealistic and yeah. unobtainable, that they were ordinary people walking around just like we are. And what's your role in the theodrama, again, Balthazar's language? I mean, who cares about the ego drama? That's what I want, that's what I'm planning, I'm producing and acting in this drama that I'm writing. Who cares? That but that was matter. a play then too. The apostles were jealous, some want to be more important than others, yeah, and right. the money and the... The ego drama. The theodrama is the drama God's directing and producing, and you're in it. He's got a role for you. See, Joseph was, was entirely given over to the theodrama. Tell me what to do. I'm listening to you. Now I'm going to go do it. And I, I might not look like a hero in the eyes of the world. When Joseph died, I mean, who would have known about him? Maybe a handful of people in his little town, Nazareth. But he now becomes the patron of the universal church, the greatest male saint in our tradition, because he surrendered to the theodrama. Well, that's available to every one of us. Bishop Byron, do you feel a sense that things are beginning to change? Because I know that there's a new study from the Pontifical University of the Holy Cross, yeah. and they were showing that there was this growing interest in spirituality among young people. Yes, and I, I quite agree with that. And it's very much a correlate to what I was saying earlier. The crisis is going to produce a new hunger. People can't live in the buffered self forever. They can't, because the heart rebels against that. They will realize in time that the goods of the world are not satisfying the hungry heart, and so they'll look for something more. I do think the presence of people online who are beginning to speak about deeper spiritual things, and if you watch it, some of the most popular podcasts in the world, people that even 10 years ago were using very secularist language are now talking spiritual language. Or Russell Brand. Yeah, good example. Recently, well. Russell yeah. Brand. Which I find fascinating. That is fascinating. And, uh, and who would have thought that? Who would have thought? Ten years ago. Five or ten years ago. But to me it makes perfect sense. Is, is they will realize in time that it's not enough and the heart keeps pressing uh, outward and upward. So I, I'm aware of that kind of in the zeitgeist. There's this moment of new spiritual interest. Let's take advantage of it. You know, let's, um, now the church should move into that space and to say boldly but lovingly, we have the answers. You know, you, you've now experienced the hunger. We got the bread of life that will satisfy it. Bishop Byron, it was great talking to you, and thank you again for your time. Always a joy to be with you. Thanks.